My name is Brenda Rogers. I'm the chair of the Sustainability Committee here at West Valley College. Um, could I have folks raise their hands, other members of our Sustainability Committee here? Brad, Heidi, yes, there you are. Wonderful, thank you. So it is my great honor today to introduce to you Dr. Naomi Oreskes. She comes to us from Harvard. She flew out from, um, from Massachusetts just today. And she's here to talk about her book. Um, we have copies of her book here. We'll have a book signing afterwards if you'd like to purchase the book and talk to Naomi personally. It's Merchants of Doubt. This book, she co-authored it with Eric M. Conway. And it's how a handful of scientists obscured the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming. So this is the first keynote speak, speaking engagement for two days of Earth stewardship activities. This one kicks us off. We have a whole day tomorrow in the theater beginning at 8.30. We hope you can come. I know some of you students here are here, there, and you need um, extra credit slips. There are these green slips here. <laughs> so please see Heidi afterwards, and we'll give you an extra credit slip. So Naomi, I would love to have you come on up. So Naomi comes to us from Harvard. She's also uh, taught at UC uh, San Diego, and she wrote, no doubt about the history of science. She was quoted by Al Gore in An Inconvenient Truth. She's also been an advisor to Tony Blair over in England. She had a geology appointment over in Australia. She is a science historian, history and science. Come on up, Naomi. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Let's see if I can get the uh, computer back. Okay, um, it's great to be here. It's so great to be back in the Bay Area, which I consider kind of home because I uh, got my PhD at Stanford and spent most of my growing up life in California. So when people ask me where I'm from, I say, well, California, but I'm living in Massachusetts. So, um, so I, I feel that I'm a very lucky person because something happened to me that most academics dream of that never actually happens, which is I wrote a book that got made into a movie. So Merchants of Doubt has now been made into a documentary film. This does seem very loud. Is it too loud to you, or is it just, no, it's fine, okay. Um, Merchants of Doubt has been made into a documentary film produced by participant media who are the same people who produced An Inconvenient Truth, uh, directed by Robin Kenner, who's the filmmaker who made Food Inc., which those of you who are interested in the sustainability of food and agricultural production We'll definitely want to see that film. Um, and it's being distributed by Sony Pictures, so like the big boys. Um, it's a real movie. It's playing in movie theaters. It's been here in the Bay Area. I don't know if it's still playing. Um, if you have not had a chance to see it, uh, check it out and see it. It may still be playing in the Bay Area. If not, it will go to Netflix and Amazon and streaming and all those things probably sometime in the summer. So um, what I couldn't do tonight, though, is actually show the film, because since it is still in theaters, Sony won't let us show it uh, at colleges and universities now. But what they will let us do is to show a little piece of it. So I want to start with a little clip from the film that talks a little bit about how I got involved in this issue of climate change, um, how I sort of, how a mild mannered historian of science working in a dusty archive ended up, you know, being in the movies. So we'll start by showing the film clip, and then I'll talk more about the work. I was always interested in broader questions about scientific knowledge, why we believe some things and not others, how do scientists come to consensus, and what does it take for scientists to say, yes, we know that this is true? But the problem is there's no consensus on what's causing it. Consensus has not been met among scientists on this issue. More than a decade after Hansen had testified in Congress that climate change was happening, 
the media are still presenting this question as a big scientific debate. Gentlemen, I'm sure that this debate is going to continue for a long, long time. So I had the idea that we could test this question of whether or not there was a consensus among scientists, active scientists, people who were actually doing research and publishing in peer-reviewed journals. So not the public at large, not politicians, but scientists. And so we got a list of all of the papers that had been published from 1992 to 2002 that had used the keyword phrase global climate change. And then we read them. The question was, how many of these papers disagree that most of the observed warming is due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations? So I certainly thought we would get some that disagreed and when we found nothing, then I thought, oh, this is a result that needs to be published. When my article on the scientific consensus came out, I started getting emails threatening me, saying that I was a communist, that I should be fired from my job. A few people began to say to me, there are other people who have also been attacked in a way that seems similar. People who worked on acid rain, people who worked on the ozone hole, so I started doing research on the people who were attacking me. And that's when I discovered a startling fact. They were the same people who had attacked the scientists on all these different issues. Then I began to realize this is a debate, but this is not a scientific debate. And if it's not a scientific debate, then the question becomes, well, what sort of a debate is it? I really was pulled into this issue, not because I set out to write a story about climate change denial, but because I actually became a victim of the climate change denial machine. And so my colleague Eric Conway and I began to do research, as we say in the film clip, began to ask the question, well, why would scientists exploit scientific uncertainty? Why would scientists promote doubt about science, doubt and distrust about a set of issues? And that's the story that became uh, emergence of doubt. So I want to go back a little bit here to the year 2007. So in 2007, the Gallup polling organization, working together with Yale University, did a poll of American people and found that at that time, 72% of Americans were completely or mostly convinced that global warming was happening. In fact, 62% of us believed at that time that life on Earth would continue without major disruptions only if we took immediate and drastic action to reduce global warming. And indeed, at that time, even more many former contrarians had come around. So the work that is shown in the film, I was doing that work on this question of whether or not there was a scientific consensus in 2003. And honestly, at some, you know, it seemed though that the debate was getting resolved. It seemed in 2006, 2007. And at one point, Eric Conway and I uh, I think back, I think we were so naive, we thought, oh, by the time we finish this book, it will just be of historic interest because there won't be any climate change denial anymore. Well, we were definitely wrong about that. But it made sense to think that at the time, because many former contrarians had come around. So for example, one of them was a man named Frank Luntz. Frank Luntz is famous, some people would say infamous, because he is a Republican pollster and strategy who, um, let me first of all say, so this is what he said when he kind of came around and said he believed climate change was real. Uh, so in an interview in 2006, he said, it's now 2006. So he was off to a good start, he got the year right. <laughs> I think most people would conclude that there's global warming taking place and that the behavior of humans are affecting the climate. So he's still struggling with syntax. Now, why is Luntz important? Well, because as a Republican strategist, he had written a memo in 2003 to Republican candidates using, uh, encouraging them to use the phrase climate change rather than global warming. He felt that Republicans were vulnerable on environmental issues, particularly climate change, because polls did show that the American people cared about climate change, believed it was happening, and believed that it mattered. 
but Republicans had been on denial in this issue. And so rather than accept the scientific evidence and say, well, as Bobby Jindal put it, that's stopping the party of stupid, instead he, he advised Republicans on the way to sort of dance around the issue. He told them to use the phrase climate change rather than global warming, because in his words, quote, climate change is a lot less frightening. And in a memo entitled Winning the Global Warming Debate, he advised Republicans to emphasize scientific uncertainty and to insist that there is no consensus, as you saw in that clip from Fox News uh, in the film. He wrote, the scientific debate remains open. Voters believe that there is no consensus within the scientific community. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, then their views on global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the political debate. So here we see in a nutshell the doubt mongering strategy, using scientific uncertainty as a political tool. Now, we can ask the question, was Luntz's position factually correct? Was the debate still open? Was the science still unsettled? No, the answer is no. In 2001, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world's largest organization of professional scientists who do research on the climate system, had concluded that, quote, human activities are modifying the concentration of atmospheric constituents that absorb or scatter radiant energy. Most of the observed warming over the last 50 years is likely to have been due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. And that was the sentence, that was the phrase that I used in my study to test the question of whether or not the science was settled. That is to say, I asked the question, how many papers published in peer-reviewed scientific literature disagree with the IPCC conclusion? And the answer, as you saw in that film, was none. But in fact, as I looked deeper into the question, what I realized was that the science had actually told us even earlier. In 1995, so before most of you were born, in the second assessment of the IPCC, scientists had concluded that the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human impact on global climate. And this was the result that I published in the essay published in Science Magazine. Now, this analysis surprised many people. In fact, it led some people to say, well, obviously there's a debate, so if Oreskes can't find it, she must be incompetent. But it really should not have come as a surprise, because the United States is a signatory to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed by President George H.W. Bush in 1992. The Framework Convention commits the United States and other signatories to taking action to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. So we already knew in 1992 that climate change was a potential problem, and our first president Bush signed an international treaty to do something about it. Indeed, when he signed that treaty, he pledged to translate the written document into concrete action to protect the planet. So I began to wonder, what had happened? Why didn't we take the concrete steps that President Bush had promised, and how did the Republican Party move from the position it took under President Bush, acknowledging the reality of climate change, committing to do something about it, to the position advocated by Frank Luntz to say, oh, the science isn't settled, to the position we have today where leading Republicans say that climate change is a hoax. And why didn't we take those concrete steps that President Bush promised us? So what I want to do tonight is to give you a brief history of the evolution of climate science how scientists first came to think that climate change would be a problem, but then to tell the story of the emergence of a political challenge to that science. It's a story of selling uncertainty, of selling doubt, and it was motivated by a doctrinaire belief in free market capitalism born and hardened in the Cold War. So the history of science regarding climate change can well, as any historian knows, there's a lot of different places you can start, but a good place to start for this story is the work of John Tyndall, who lived from 1820 to 1893. John Tyndall was the person who established that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And by that we mean that it's highly transparent to visible light, so light from the sun comes through the Earth's atmosphere, 
penetrates the atmosphere quite easily. It heats the Earth, but then that heat, that warmth, that infrared radiation is trapped by the carbon dioxide. So greenhouse gases are relatively transparent to visible light, but relatively opaque to infrared. And that's how they warm the planet. And this is something that we have known, that scientists have understood for more than 150 years. Now, in the early 1900s, the Swedish geochemist Svante Arrhenius first suggested that increasing atmospheric CO2 from burning fossil fuels could warm the planet. He did the first calculations of what the impact of doubling carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would be, and calculated that it would increase the mean global temperature of the Earth, the average temperature, between 1.5 and, and 4.5 and degrees centigrade, or that's about 2 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, Arrhenius was Swedish, so he thought warming would be a good thing. The first person to suggest that it might be a bad thing, and also to suggest that it might actually already be underway, was the British steam engineer Guy Stewart Callender. In 1938, Callender published the first scientific paper that suggested that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was already increasing from burning coal, and that it might be affecting the temperature. Now, like many scientific problems, the problem of climate change does have legitimate uncertainties, which scientists, in fact, have addressed over the course of the last 80 or 90 years. And one important uncertainty was the competing effect of water vapor. Tyndall and others had shown that although it is true that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, so is water vapor. And some people argue that since there's so much more water vapor in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, then some small additional increase in carbon dioxide would not, in fact, have an effect. And this is an argument that you often hear skeptics and contrarians making even today. So it's important to know that that was a legitimate question. It is a legitimate question. And it was answered more than 60 years ago by this man, Gilbert Platts. Class was a pioneer in upper atmosphere spectroscopy, that is to say, measuring the wavelengths at which gases absorb heat and light in the atmosphere. And he was able to show that the wavelengths at which carbon dioxide absorb heat and light are different than the wavelengths at which water absorbs heat. And so therefore, even though it's true that there's much more water vapor in the atmosphere than CO2, additional CO2 still has a significant measurable effect. So this is an important scientific question, and it was answered more than half a century ago. Class, Calendar, and Arrhenius' work all came to the attention to a, to a group of scientists working at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla in the 1950s. And two of them, these men, Hans Seuss on the left, Roger Revelle on the right, published an article in 1957 in which they called attention to this question of what the impact of increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere might be. And they argued that by putting into the atmosphere carbon dioxide that had been stored in rocks, in coal and oil and gas formations, stored in rocks over the course of hundreds of millions of years, but now returned to the atmosphere in just a few decades, that we humans were performing a great geophysical experiment, that we were experimenting on this planet that we call Earth. And they said that scientists needed to pay attention, that we should begin to measure the carbon dioxide, to track it, to monitor it, in order to be able to determine down the road whether or not that increased atmospheric concentration was having an effect on the climate. And that became the life's work of this man, who was my colleague when I taught at the University of California in San Diego, Charles David Keeling. In 1958, Dave Keeling became what began what became his life work, the production of what's now known as the Keeling Curve. The Keeling Curve, shown here on the left, is this data that shows us how carbon dioxide has been steadily increasing in the Earth's atmosphere since Dave Keeling first started measuring it in 1958. This work is so well established in the scientific community that it is now engraved on the walls of the US National Academy of Sciences headquarters Washington, D.C., next to engravings of Darwin's finches and the DNA double helix structure. There is no question in the scientific community that carbon dioxide has increased. And in fact, 
There was no question of that even in 1965. So here's 1965. In 1965, Dave had seven years of data, but it was enough for him and his colleagues to say, look, it is increasing. In just those seven years, it's gone from 315 parts per million to 320. Does anyone in the audience know where it is today? 400, yeah, we're like over here. We're like way above Dave's head. Yeah, we're above, 373, 400. Yeah, we're about, we're right about, right about his ear there. So. so here's the interesting thing. In 1965, scientists began to try to communicate to political leaders what this meant. And a committee led by Roger Revelle and Dave Keeling wrote a report for the President's Science Advisory Committee in which they wrote, they accurately predicted that by the year 2000, there will be about 25% more CO2 in our atmosphere than at present, and this will modify the heat balance of the atmosphere to such an extent that market changes in climate could occur. In fact, they slightly underestimated, by the year 2000, the increase was actually about 30%, but they got it pretty close. And we know that this report reached the White House under President Lyndon Johnson because in a special message to Congress that same year, President Johnson said, this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale to a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. That was in 1965. So we have known about this problem. Politicians have known about this problem for about half a century. Now, admittedly, in 1965, President Johnson had a few other things to worry about. The war in Vietnam was going badly, so the rights workers were being murdered uh, in Mississippi, and not much serious interest was paid to the question of policy circles. But that began to change in the 1970s, as scientists began to develop what they called general circulation models, computer models of the Earth's climate as a system that could begin to do a quantitative analysis of how the changes in the atmosphere were affecting not just the climate, but also things like the amount of moisture in the atmosphere uh, and the heating of the ocean. And so scientists in the 1970s began to revisit what they called the calendar question, whether or not increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would change the climate. And this work did begin to generate serious discussion in policy circles. Reports were written at the National Research Council, at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, at the U.S. Department of Energy, and a number of other places. Indeed, there were so many reports at this time that the U.S. National Academy of Sciences wrote, a plethora of studies from diverse sources indicates a consensus that climate changes will result from man's combustion of fossil fuels and changes in land use. So we see here already recognized the problem in a nutshell, that climate change could be driven by burning fossil fuels and also by deforestation and other forms of land use changes. So we see that already in 1979, scientists had a consensus that climate change would occur. They also had a consensus that it mattered, that it was not a small concern. They wrote, quote, the close linkage between man's welfare and the climatic regime within which his society has evolved suggests that such climate changes would have profound impacts on human society. And again, one of the forms of denial we see today is people say, well, okay, yeah, there's a little climate change, but so what? It's no big deal. But no, it is a big deal. And scientists have been trying to tell us this for a long, long time. Now, in 1979, they had a consensus that climate change was expected to occur. But the big question was when? Most scientists at that time did not think that changes would be detectable until the beginning of the 21st century. Some people said by the year 2000, some people would just say by the end of the century, in the end of the um, 20th century, some people talk about the beginning of the 21st century. So the scientific community was surprised when only six years later, NASA climate modeler James Hansen and his team concluded that the human fingerprint, the human signal, the human effect on the climate had in fact already been detected. And it was this, this conclusion that he testified to in 1988 
say that he and his team were 99% certain that climate change was detectable. And this is the testimony that I refer to at the start of that clip when I say uh, more than a decade after Hansen had testified, the issue was still being to be treated in the media as a big debate. So a scientific consensus was emerging, and it was this emerging and disturbing consensus that climate change was already happening sooner than people had expected that led to the creation in 1988, that same year, of the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But it also led to something else. It led to the emergence of a politically motivated campaign to challenge that consensus, to cast doubt upon the science. This campaign focused on the claim that the science was unsettled, and therefore it would be premature for us to act to do anything about the problem. As a historian, I'm interested in origins. And what Eric Conley and I discovered was that the origins of this claim could be traced back to a handful of people. Now today, as many of you know, doubt about climate science is promoted in many quarters. But one of the most important for a long period of time, in fact, going back to 1988, is the George C. Marshall Institute, a think tank in Washington, D.C. For more than two decades, the Marshall Institute has denied the reality of climate change or insisted that if there is climate change, it's not caused by people, or even if it's caused by people, it's no big deal we can just adapt to it. So who are these people? Where did the Marshall Institute come from? And why do they promote doubt about long-established science? Well, ironically, and in some ways shockingly, this was one of the things that when Eric and I discovered it, we thought, really? The Marshall Institute was actually founded by scientists. It was founded by these three men, all prominent physicists who had come to positions of power and influence during the Cold War for their role in American weapons and rocketry programs. So on the left, Robert Jastrow, Jastrow was an astrophysicist by training, head of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, and very involved in the design of the Apollo uh, lunar missions. Uh, ironically, he was also the man who hired Jim Hansen at NASA. On the right, Bill Nirenberg, the longtime director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where ironically he succeeded uh, Roger Revell as director. Also a nuclear physicist, Nirenberg has cut his teeth as a young man, actually as a graduate student, working on isotope separation for the Manhattan Project to build the atomic bomb. And in the middle, perhaps the most famous of the three to historians of science, Frederick Seitz, one of the leading solid state physicists of the 20th century, wrote a textbook that for many years was the standard textbook in solid state physics, and rose to become president of the US National Academy of Sciences and president of the Rockefeller University, one of the most distinguished research universities in America. So all three distinguished, famous, brilliant men, none of them climate scientists, all of them Cold War physicists. In the early 1980s, these men found themselves working together on an advisory panel to the Reagan administration on the question of the Strategic Defense Initiative, sometimes referred to as Star Wars, the idea that we could build a weapons program to knock Soviet missiles, uh, incoming Soviet missiles, to knock them out with lasers or other instruments and therefore protect ourselves from a potential Soviet first strike. Now this concept was highly controversial and most scientists opposed it, particularly most weapons scientists, because it threatened to destabilize the balance of power that had kept the peace during the Cold War. And because if we thought we had a, a shield that could protect us, we might be tempted to launch a first strike. And so thousands of American physicists, literally thousands, over 6,000 American physicists, signed a petition saying that they were opposed to the Star Wars program. But Jastrow, Seitz, and Nuremberg strongly supported it. And in 1984, they created the Marshall Institute to defend the Strategic Defense Initiative against scientists' opposition and to promote the continued importance of science and technology in national defense in part by insisting on the reality of Soviet strength and of US weakness. So a kind of fear-mongering campaign to say, the United States is falling behind the Soviet Union. We need to build more and more weapons. We need to build the Strategic Defense Initiative. We mustn't fall behind. 
They wrote many articles, published opinion pieces in newspapers. I don't have time to talk about this in detail, but I just want to show you one uh, particularly striking example. This article was written by Robert Jastrow, America has five years left. And it goes on to say how if we don't rebuild our nuclear weapons program, we will be overtaken by the Soviet Union, and basically uh, the Soviet Union will be able to dictate terms to us, and it will be the end of democracy in America. And this article, you'll notice, was written in 1987. It was actually the Soviet Union that had five years left. <laughs> Now, here's where the story takes an interesting twist. So up until now, these are physicists working on issues that are related to the work they've done as physicists, building rocketry, weapons programs, working on missile defense. But at that time, Frederick Seitz had actually retired from work as a physicist. In fact, he actually hadn't been working as a physicist for quite some years. And he had taken on a job as a consultant to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Corporation. Now, one of the things we know from the work of historians like Robert Proctor at Stanford, uh, also tobacco control experts like Stan Blantz at UCSF, and also from civil litigation against the tobacco industry, is that for decades, the tobacco industry protected its product against the scientific evidence of the harms of tobacco use through doubt mongering. By insisting that the science regarding tobacco was unsettled, that there wasn't a consensus among scientists, that doctors smoked camels, and therefore it would be wrong for the government to do anything to try to control tobacco use. In 1989, these two stories merged. The Cold War ended. The Soviet Union began to break apart. So you might have thought that these men would be happy, that the West had won the Cold War, and that they had succeeded in containing communism, which was, after all, their aim. But instead, they found a new enemy. And that enemy was what they called environmental extremism. What they thought was an exaggeration of environmental threats by people with a left-wing agenda. And what they began to do in 1988-89 was to apply the tobacco strategy that Fred Seitz had learned working for R.J. Reynolds now to a whole set of other issues. Doubt is our product and the infamous memo written by one tobacco industry executive in 1969, since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. So there's the merchants of doubt strategy in a nutshell. Scientists create a body of fact, and we compete with it by generating doubt. We sell doubt. We merchandise doubt. Doubt is our product. But one of the things the tobacco industry recognized was that if tobacco industry executives stood up in public and said, well, we're not persuaded that tobacco is harmful, most of us would not find that very persuasive. It would be obvious to us that the tobacco industry had a vested economic interest in denying the scientific evidence of the harms of their products. But if scientists said it, that was a whole different matter. If scientists said it, people would listen. If scientists said it, it would be reported in the New York Times, which it was until 1979. So the tobacco industry understood that for the doubt mongering strategy to work, you had to recruit scientists, and ideally distinguished scientists. So when Fred Seitz agreed to work for R.J. Reynolds, that for them was the best possible thing. I mean, who better to defend tobacco than a former president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences? So what we found in our research and what we explain in our book is that these scientists supplied it but not just about tobacco, about a whole set of other issues as well, including the threat of nuclear winter, the reality and causes of acid rain, the severity of the ozone hole, and ultimately the mother of all environmental issues, the human causes of global warming. The physicists in our story cast doubt on the science related to every one of these issues. And in every single case, the strategy was the same that the science was unsettled, there was no consensus, and therefore the science was too uncertain to justify action. Now, to learn how they did this, you'll need to read the book, or see the movie. But what I want to do here today is to, to talk about why they did it. Because I think this is the part of the story that in a way has been most surprising for most people, 
and also that I think we really need to understand if we're ever going to address it. Because most people have just assumed, most people would assume, that this is a story of scientists being corrupted by money. And what we found in our story was that really wasn't what was going on. Now, it's not to say that there aren't people who are corrupted by money. And certainly, if you see the film, in the film, there are a lot of people who actually are corrupted by money. But this original story, the place where this begins and how it gets going, and especially, and most crucially, why it gains traction with so many of our fellow American citizens, particularly on the conservative side of the American political spectrum. Beginning in the early 1990s and continuing through today, as the science became more secure, the message of doubt and distrust became more widespread. And it was spread through a network of think tanks and foundations. Think tanks and foundations that promote free market economic solutions to social problems. So for example, and many of them have very nice sounding names, like for example, the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute, which makes us think about democracy in America the Cato Institute, who promote free market solutions to social problems, the American Enterprise Institute, they all believe in enterprise, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, Americans believe in competition, the Heartland Institute, that makes you feel good, the Heritage Foundation, Frontiers of Freedom, the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, and of course, the most recent and most powerful of all, Americans for Prosperity. I mean, who could be against prosperity? So they all have these very nice sounding names. But if we look closely, what we see is that none of these is a scientific research institution. All of them promote less say, fair economics, and all promote free market solutions to social and environmental problems. George, Mar Mar George Soros has referred to the ideology underlying this theory as free market fundamentalism, a kind of fundamental faith in the capacity of market-based economics to solve our problems, and the corollary belief that all wealth arises from free markets and that any attempt to intervene, even for a good cause, like to protect people from cancer, will end up being counterproductive. The academic term for this set of beliefs, and since this is a university, I have to call it, I have to give you the academic version, uh, is neoliberalism. So what is that? Well, traditional liberalism that we associate with people like Locke and Mill and David Hume focused on the rights of the individual. The original liberal philosophers, also Thomas Jefferson, uh, the French Enlightenment philosophers, lived in a world of kings and queens. They lived in a world of despotic monarchs, and they focused on the rights of individuals because they were thinking about how to construct forms of governance in which individuals would have rights in contrast to what had gone before in a world where kings and queens ruled and individuals had no rights. Modern neoliberalism is different. It's not so much focused on the rights of individuals as individuals. It's actually focused on deregulation and the idea of releasing the so-called magic of the marketplace. It came to prominence in the early 1980s, promoted particularly by Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and by Ronald Reagan here in the United States. But it wasn't just conservatives, Tories, and Republicans. It was also promoted throughout the 1990s in something called the Washington Consensus, led by Democratic President Bill Clinton and UK Labor leader Tony Blair. Indeed, I think many academics would argue that right up until 2008, when the global fiscal collapse, there was a bipartisan consensus in most of the United States and Europe on the virtues of deregulation. But the roots of this thing can actually come out of the Cold War. In fact, there are two key texts that modern neoliberals frequently invoke and cite. And these are these two books, the book Capitalism and, Free, Free, Capitalism and Freedom, written by the Chicago economist Milton Friedman, and first published in 1962, and the book that inspired Milton Friedman, The Road to Serfdom, by the Austrian neoliberal economist Friedrich von Hayek. So what is the argument in these books? Both Friedman and von Hayek were economists, but the argument of these books is not primarily an economic argument. It's a political argument. It's not primarily an argument in defense of free market capitalism as an efficient means to deliver goods and services. It's a political argument that capitalism and freedom are linked. And if we wish to preserve political freedom, 
we must preserve economic freedom as well. The crux of the argument is that, free market, is that the free market is a form of distributed political power. That various individuals making free choices every day hold power in their hands and prevent its concentration in centralized government. Conversely, centrally planned economies entail not just the concentration of economic power, but of political power as well. And so if you want to preserve political freedom, civic freedom, religious freedom, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, you must protect economic freedom as the core of that. That the free market is viewed as a bulwark against totalitarianism, against tyranny. Now, how did this become a Cold War argument? Von Hayek wrote his famous book, The Road to Serfdom, in 1944. He was worried about what would happen in Western Europe at the end of the war, uh, based on the fact that in many countries in Europe, communists had played an important role in resistance, and the economies of Europe were pretty much wrecked by the war, and had already been damaged by the Depression before that. And, and many people thought that communist or socialist governments would come to power in Europe after World War II. The United States was quite worried about that, in fact. But of course, it's not what actually happened. Most of the European governments after World War II created social democracies that were fundamentally democratic and capitalistic, but with some reasonable interventions, such as providing nationalized health insurance. But as the Cold War progressed, and as the Soviet Union extended its reach into many of the countries of Eastern Europe, some of von Hayek's anxieties and concerns began to seem a little more realistic than they might have in 1944. And it was taken up, these arguments were taken up in force by Milton Friedman uh, in the 1960s. And you'll note that Capitalism and Freedom was published in 1962, the coldest moment of the Cold War during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So how does this relate then back to our scientists? Well, for Robert Jastrow and his colleagues, the Cold War battle to protect freedom was not just played out in the realm of nuclear weapons and strategic defense, but also in the realm of government regulation. And this, I think, helps to explain the origins of the story in the Strategic Defense Initiative. The goal of SDI was the same as all Cold War US weapons and rocketry programs, to defend the free world against the threat of communist expansion. Jastrow and his colleagues understood their work as a kind of technological arm of the political commitment to the defense of American freedom. So again, just to give one example, in 1984, Lieutenant General Daniel O. Graham wrote to Bill Nuremberg asking him to join Bob Jastrow in defending SDI. Graham was the originator of the concept of what was originally called the high frontier, the idea that space was the final frontier of warfare, and therefore that the United States had to militarize space. And in writing to Nuremberg asking him to help in this project, he wrote that this was their chance to recapitulate the work of the founding fathers and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So invoking the preamble of the American Constitution. But again, let's return to the question, though, of why a scientist would defend tobacco. How do we get from believing in political freedom, believing in containing communism, to defending a product that, you know, kills people? Well, the key, the answer to this is that it's a slippery slope argument. Remember, von Hayek's book is called The Road to Serfdom. The argument is that we begin to chip away at our freedoms, and before we know it, we're living under dictatorship. And the reason why they turn to environmentalism is because environmentalists and public health activists typically argued for some form of regulation. And these men felt that for regulation of acid rain or secondhand smoke or greenhouse gases, you were on the slippery slope towards government control of your lives. And this articulated idea we see articulated in many of their writings but most clearly by a Ford scientist who also joined the cause in the 1980s, a man by the name of S. Fred Singer. Like the others, Singer was a, sci a physicist. In fact, he was the proverbial rocket scientist. He had worked on the very earliest days of the American rocketry programs. And like the others, he challenged the scientific evidence of acid rain, global warming, the ozone hole, and also the harms of tobacco. 
So I mentioned that starting in 1979, Fred Seitz had worked for the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, and in the early 1990s, Singer worked for the Philip Morris Company to attack the Environmental Protection Agency over the issue of secondhand smoke. In 1993, Singer wrote a report co-authored by a lawyer for the Cato Institute named Ken Jeffries called The EPA and the Science of the Environmental Tobacco Smoke. It was published by the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute, one of the institutes I've already mentioned. So again, invoking the notion of freedom and democracy. But, and this is a good example of how this whole thing works, but the funding for this report actually came from the Tobacco Institute, which was supposed to be the research arm of the Tobacco Institute. Jeffries was a lawyer affiliated with the Cato Institute and also the Competitive Enterprise Institute. So it's an attack on the EPA, it's funded by the tobacco industry, and it's channeled through these laissez-faire, free market fundamentalist, libertarian think tanks. Now, why were they attacking the EPA over secondhand smoke? Well, the EPA had declared that secondhand smoke was a Class A or proven carcinogen. Uh, and this result had been affirmed by the US Surgeon General. In fact, there's a kind of an interesting story behind this. The tobacco industry was always worrying about what things were called. And they were always trying to come up with names for things that sounded better than the things really were. So they didn't like the phrase secondhand smoke because they reckoned Americans didn't like secondhand things. So they decided to call it environmental tobacco smoke instead because everyone likes the environment. Except there was one flaw in that, that idea, which was that if it was environmental tobacco smoke, then it fell under the rubric of the Environmental Protection Agency. And indeed, the EPA concluded that it did. The EPA reviewed more than 6,000 independent peer-reviewed studies on the harms of tobacco use. So why would a rocket scientist challenge that work? Indeed, why would any scientist challenge it? Why would any scientist defend a product that they knew killed people? Well, Fred Singer answered that question in his own words. He wrote, if we do not carefully regulate, sorry, if we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, there's essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. So there it is in a nutshell, the slippery slope to socialism, the road to serfdom. Today, tobacco smoke, tomorrow, the Bill of Rights. And we see this point being made in different ways by many different people who have challenged the scientific evidence of climate change. Frank Luntz, the pollster that we talked about at the beginning, made a similar point when challenging climate science in the Wall Street Journal in 2003. Once we can see that greenhouse gases must be controlled, it will only be a matter of time before we end up endorsing more damaging regulation. So what we see in this story is that this debate was not about the science. It wasn't about the accuracy of climate models. It wasn't about the quality of Dave Killing's work. It wasn't about the impacts that climate change is having on biodiversity. It was about governance. It was about control and about the fundamental question of the role of government in our lives and whether government should intervene or when government should intervene in the marketplace to protect us from dangers. Now, the latter is a legitimate question. The problem is not that the question is illegitimate. The problem is that the claims made by the merchants of doubt are deeply misleading, if not entirely false. And what they have done is to camouflage a political debate under the rubric of a scientific debate, to make us think that the science was unsettled in order not to confront the reality of the political motivations behind their work. So as I've already pointed out, the claims of the merchants of doubt are scientifically misleading because among climate scientists, the men and women who are the experts who do the work, there is no doubt that climate change is real, underway, and a serious, if not grave, threat. Indeed, the IPCC in the last assessment report used the word unequivocal, a word you hardly ever find in the history of science. But the claims are not just scientifically misleading, they're politically misleading as well. Contrarians frequently assert that climate scientists and environmentalists are socialists seeking to control our lives. They refer to environmentalists as watermelons, green on the outside but red on the inside. 
George Will, who writes for the Washington Post, generally thought to be a liberal newspaper, has called environmentalism a green tree with red roots. And Senator James Inhofe has threatened to indict climate scientists for conspiracy to lie to Congress, accusing them of being part of a liberal conspiracy to bring down global capitalism, to which I reply that liberals should be so organized. But here's the thing. I've spent most of my professional life studying scientists, particularly earth scientists, and none of them are socialists. I can't think of a single earth scientist I know who actually is a scientist. And they certainly don't want to control other people's lives. In fact, most scientists I know don't even care about other people. They're not interested in people. And environmentalism is not a green tree with red roots. In fact, some of you may know, if you've taken US history, that the origins of the US environmental movement are to be found in the progressive republicanism of Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, the first director of the US Forest Service, and of course that famous communist, John D. Rockefeller. Indeed, throughout most of the 20th century, there was a bipartisan consensus in the United States on the importance of environmental protection. From one of the earliest environmental laws, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act of 1917, to the National the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Marine Mammal Protection Act of the 1970s, um, and many, many other bills, all of which passed Congress by wide bipartisan margins, and which were signed into law by both Democratic and Republican presidents. In fact, many of you may know some of you maybe don't know, that the EPA was created by a Republican president, Richard Nixon. But things began to change in the 1980s, when scientific evidence began to reveal serious problems like acid rain, the ozone hole, and global warming. Problems that seemed to demand not just government action, but serious, important government action. Problems that scientists showed that the invisible hand of the marketplace wasn't solving. And these problems, the scientific evidence of these problems, the scientific consensus about these problems, began to coalesce just as the Reagan administration was arguing for less government and less regulation as advocated by Milton Friedman, shown here signing uh, shaky hands to the president. And this, I would argue, put American conservatives on a collision course with science. Now, just from tobacco use, Acid rain, ozone hole, and global warming, damage from global warming, are all market failures. But it wasn't economists who discovered them. It was scientists doing science. And this is why scientists became the target of conservative attack. Because they had revealed fundamental market failures. Moreover, despite the resistance, the resistance that we describe and document in our book, the fact is that we solved these earlier problems with appropriate government interventions in the marketplace. So acid rain in the Midwest and air pollution in Southern California were addressed and to a very large extent solved by an emissions trading system set up in the case of acid rain by the federal government under the Clean Air Act amendments, in the case of Southern California under an emissions trading law known as a reclaim. And as you probably know, since we're in California, California is now addressing greenhouse gases through AB 32, also an emissions trading program. In the case of the ozone hole, we learned from science that the ozone hole was caused by a specific group of chemicals known as CFCs, chlorinated fluorocarbons, and those chemicals were banned under an international treaty, the Montreal Protocol. And the ozone hole is now, um, the ozone layer is now recovering, so it worked. And tobacco, well, there's still smoking in the world, of course, but tobacco use in the United States is down dramatically through a mix of government interventions, which included, well, a mix of interventions, including civil and state-based litigation, government prosecution by the Department of Justice, bans on smoking in public places like restaurants, universities, and airports, and heavy taxation. Again, all of which are interventions in the marketplace. We solved these problems with these government interventions, and they worked. And we didn't end up living under a Soviet dictatorship. The slippery slope arguments are just wrong. So I'd like to conclude by making a few points. First, Ronald Reagan had a point. Government regulation is not the solution to every problem. 
and maybe some environmentalists are socialists. But it doesn't mean that global warming isn't a real problem needing real solutions. And it certainly doesn't mean that the science is wrong or that think tanks and politicians know better than scientists. We may not know everything about climate science, but if we need to ask questions, the best people to answer them are our scientists. Second, the desire to limit the scope and power of the federal government is reasonable too. And one thing great about doing historical work, about doing research, is the ways in which your research can change your own thinking. Um, when I've been on book tour and when I've done promotions for the film, I've had the chance to travel to a lot of places in the United States and not just spend time in blue states and coastal states. And I've been to Oklahoma and North Dakota and Kansas um, and Florida and a whole lot of purple states too. And across America, a lot of people have a lot of suspicion about the federal government. So if you live in Wyoming or even if you live here in California, Washington, D.C. is pretty far away. And it's pretty easy to feel like the federal government isn't really responsive to your needs. So let's acknowledge that the desire to limit the scope of the federal government is not intrinsically unreasonable. But it doesn't justify misrepresenting the science, attacking scientists, and hiding the interests of the fossil fuel industry under the guise of liberty, freedom, and especially prosperity. Third, the energy industry is not remotely a free market. So while these men are claiming that they're defending the free market, the reality is that the fossil fuel industry is massively subsidized. Most people in America think that the renewable industry is massively subsidized. Well, here's the truth. This is a plot showing the distribution of US federal energy subsidies for the most recent year that I was able to find data. Nearly 70% of all federal energy subsidies go to fossil fuels. The richest, most powerful industry in the history of mankind is heavily subsidized by our government. Here's nuclear power, ethanol, other renewables, conservation, nothing, and then who knows, some other grab bag of stuff. So look at this. The best, cheapest, most effective way to prevent climate change is to conserve energy, and we put nothing into that. Um, and this is just the United States, and it's also just what are known as direct subsidies. So this does not include what are sometimes referred to as the external costs, so the hidden costs. So the US National Academy of Sciences did a study a couple of years ago on the external costs of coal. So that would include things like respiratory illness caused by breathing in coal dust, um, lung cancer, and asbest, uh, uh, silicosis, and pneumoconiosis from coal miners. $500 billion a year in unpaid cost, essentially a form of subsidy to the coal industry. Uh, we can talk about lots of other things, exemptions to the Clean Water Act for fracking, and of course the biggest subsidy of all, the elephant in the room that we hardly ever talk about, military protection of oil supplies in the Middle East, a trillion dollar operation. This is not a free market. So if, and if we're worried about excessive concentration of power, you might think about the huge political power of the fossil fuel industry, the richest, most successful industry in the history of mankind. And finally, as a historian of science, what is for me perhaps the most important point, the cutting edge of science is always uncertain. It's always unsettled by definition. Research is all about being unsettled, asking new questions, finding new answers. And in science, there's always uncertainty. In fact, Discovery is driven by uncertainty. We don't study the things we know, we study the things we don't know. And that, in a way, makes science vulnerable to misrepresentation, because it enables the merchants of doubt to say, but look, there's uncertainty about the rate of warming. There's uncertainty about how fast Greenland is melting. And of course, that's true. But just because we don't know everything, doesn't mean we don't know anything. It doesn't mean that we haven't learned a lot since John Tyndall first told us about greenhouse gases. And one of the things we've learned is that free market capitalism, like any human system, has its limits. And these limits include the negative externalities, the cost that accrue to people who did not reap the benefit of the activities that generated them. Environmental damage is the textbook case of a negative externality. Indeed, this, I would argue, is the common thread uniting the diverse science challenged by the merchants of doubt, 
they were all market failures. They were all examples of behaviors or activities that generated large external costs, damage to the environment, death to smokers, and therefore provided a legitimate justification for the government to intervene in the marketplace. Nicholas Stern, the former chief economist of the World Bank, has called anthropogenic climate change the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. In sum, what this is all about is what sociologists call implicatory denial. People deny climate change because they don't like its implications for free market capitalism, for industry, or for their way of life. But as the conservative judge Richard Posner has argued, behavior that generates large external costs provides an application for government regulation. But how we feel about regulation will affect about how we feel about that behavior, whether it's smoking or fossil fuels. We're all more likely, liberals and conservatives, to accept evidence consistent with our pre-existing worldview. Psychologists call that confirmation bias. But as Posner points out, a rational decision maker starts with his prior probabilities, his prior beliefs, and adjusts them as new evidence comes to our attention. For more than 20 years, evidence has been mounting that man-made climate change is occurring, evidence that our scientists now tell us is unequivocal. And does denying, denying it does not make it go away. On the contrary, as our economy and I argue in our latest book, the great irony of this story, an irony that risks transmogrifying into tragedy, is that the longer we deny the reality of climate change, the more likely we are to see a climate crisis that becomes an excuse for the rise of totalitarian governments. In other words, the longer we wait, the more we risk our freedom. The Industrial Revolution brought the developed world 150 years of unprecedented prosperity. And by and large, that was a good thing. But it turned out that there was a bill we did not anticipate. That bill was global warming. And it's a bill that has now come to you. And as the novelist Kim Stanley Robinson has wisely pointed out, the invisible hand never picks up the check. Thank you very much. So I'd like to open the floor now to questions and answers. <laughs> I'm sorry, Harold, I'm reducing our problem footprint. <laughs> so if you have a question, either come forward or I can come back and share the microphone. So obviously everything that we're talking about with respect to the doubters and those who create the uncertainty position has to do with money. Are there any studies to at least quantify what the real cost would be to them if they were to follow the proper regulations to control climate change? Cost to the industry. Exactly. But the bottom line is it's not going to cost them anything. They're not going to argue about it. But if it is, they're really going to let me. Well, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there have been a lot of studies, there have been special set up. There have been studies looking at how much money they've spent on doubt-mongering campaigns, but your question is a different one. Um, I think that part of the reason this whole thing is so ugly is because ultimately the cost of the fossil fuel industry is that they have to stop being a fossil fuel industry. So in a sense, they face the same problems the tobacco industry face. They have a product that is deeply damaging. And it can't be made undamaging. There's no, I mean, the tobacco industry spent many years trying to invent or persuade people that they had a safer cigarette or a safe cigarette. But ultimately, that project was a failure. And I think we see the same thing with fossil fuels. The fossil fuel industry wants us to think that, well, we can burn gas. Gas is good, right? There's this huge advertising campaign now to try to persuade us that gas is good for climate change. Um, or, carbon capture and storage, you know, we'll, we'll figure out how to capture the carbon and we'll, we'll all be fine. But the reality is that gas isn't good, it's still a fossil fuel, it doesn't create climate change quite as rapidly as coal oil do, but it still drives climate change. And as for carbon capture and storage, 
Uh, many scientists do think that carbon capture could play some role in helping mitigate climate change, but not at the scale that would be needed if we continue to, to use fossil fuels at the rate we do now. So ultimately, the fossil fuel industry has to go out of business or has to become something else. And that's something that they're not willing to consider because they're so wildly profitable. So I think that that means that we have to make them less profitable. And there, there are sort of straightforward, and economists would say simple ways to do it, although we haven't managed it. But I mean, a carbon tax is one straightforward way to make fossil fuels more expensive and less profitable. So almost all economists who work on this issue now support a carbon tax or an emissions trading system, which can have the same basic effect. But I also think we have to make it socially more cost costly. We have to begin to say it's not OK anymore to continue to do this. And that's one of the reasons that I support the divestment movement, because I think the divestment movement is about that. It's about saying, how can we be investing in this industry that we know is destroying our future? And not only that, that is actively searching for still more fossil fuels even as we speak. I mean, how is that even remotely acceptable? So I think we do have to find a way to, to, to begin a conversation that says, the fossil fuel industry, as we know, it has to come to an end. They either have to become something else, like diversified energy companies, or they have to go out of business. Because our future really depends on it. Any questions? Explain everything so clearly you have no questions. <laughs> So back in the 1990s, British Petroleum said that that's what they were going to do. And they changed their slogan. They said that BP was going to stand for Beyond Petroleum. And they began to actually invest in solar and other renewables, buying wind power capacity, developing solar capacity, investing in improved photovoltaics, things like that. And then they dropped it. And the business case history of exactly what happened has yet to be written. It would be a great thing for someone interested in business, especially sustainable business to research. But what I've heard from most people is simply that they realized that they could not make the same kind of profits on renewables as they were making petroleum, and so they abandoned it. But had they not abandoned that, had they begun to transition over and to say, this is going to be our business model going forward, we stop exploring for more oil and gas, um, we begin focusing on renewables, other things, also biofuels, um, that, that would be the kind of thing that they could do. So, so one of the things that we run into a lot is, and I was telling you earlier about this, um, is that okay? That works? Okay. Is that I'll be teaching, and I get to the end of the class, and I think, okay, what I have done right now is I have made them all incredibly depressed. In fact, I can look around the room, and I can see some of the people just today, I made incredibly depressed. <laughs> If we were to come up with a list of action items, what are the things that individuals can do, that school communities can do, to, to work on this? It's yeah, a great question. And I put that there to say, if anyone is not depressed, then they should definitely read my new book. <laughs> but the good news is it's only 90 pages long. One reviewer said it was too short, he wished it would be more. I said, look, 90 pages of depression is all that any reader can be asked to read. So uh, you can't make it too long if it's too depressing, or vice versa. Um, so, I, but I think there's a lot of things people can do, and I think universities are a great place not to be depressed because there's so much that we actually have in our control. So I think the, one of the first absolute things that we all can be doing is walking the walk. That is to say, make our campuses carbon neutral. And here in California, that's not even that hard. It's harder in some places than others, but every American campus, through solar, through wind, through biofuels through conservation can become carbon neutral. Um, and some campuses have already committed to that. Uh, Avery Lovitz is one of the best people in America on energy conservation. He's been talking about it for 50 years, you know. Uh, he's been singing the same tune for a long time, but it's, he's right. And there are lots and lots of studies that show this, that virtually every home institution, university in America, can save at least 30% on energy bills through conservation alone. I know you're already doing some of that here on this campus. 
you save energy and you save money in the long run too. Um, often it involves upfront investment, so you have to persuade your know, people that the upfront investment is worthwhile. Um, but that's an absolutely obvious thing that can be done. Every university in this uh, country should do it, and then can become a model to other people. We show it can be done, and we encourage partners in the business community to do it too. And we show our students, and they go home and they tell their parents that you can do this at home too. My electricity now is completely solar, and I live in a place that's not half as sunny as this, right? It turns out you don't have to live in Arizona to get most of the electricity from solar. So there's a lot of things people can do. Um, I also think political action is hugely important. So there are a lot of things we can do ourselves, but there are things we can't do individually that we have to do collectively. I always like to say I can change my light bulbs, but I can't change my electricity grid. So we need a smart grid. We need a carbon tax. We need uh, to eliminate the subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. These are all things that have to be done politically. And so we have to become involved politically. And there are lots of ways that can be done. There are so many good organizations in this country now um, working on this issue. On the website for the film, we have a list of organizations that we think are doing great work. Uh, it includes groups like Mothers Out Front that are mobilizing mothers uh, as a powerful political force, kind of modeled after Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Citizens Climate Lobby that are able to have chapters in every single congressional district in the country. Grassroots Politics going to visit congressmen in every single state in this country. Um, they're doing an amazing job to get the idea of a carbon tax uh, on the table across the country. So there are lots and lots of great organizations. There are some really interesting ones here in California working on environmentalism in relationship to social justice um, and inequality. So there are so many good things going on. And almost no matter what your interest or angle is, you can find an organization that kind of matches your um, angle. So I think uh, everyone should do that. Go to the web page for the film versions of Dow. Just look up, just Google versions of Dow film, and uh, there's a whole list of organizations. There's lots more. 350.org. Um, you know, there, the list goes on and on. I don't think it's hard to find a group to join. But the best thing is to join a group that's in your community, right? It's local, so you can connect with other people, and then you don't feel depressed because you're not alone. <laughs> uh, so with that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the question is, you know, how are we going to change the minds of the doubters? Can we change their minds? My view is that certain people are hopeless, and it's not actually worth wasting time on it. We know that about 25 percent of Americans still don't think that smoking causes cancer, and my guess is that those people also don't believe in climate change. So forget about it. They won't be persuaded. They will probably die of lung cancer. And that's sad for their families, but there it is. I don't think it's really worth worrying about those people too much because the reality is you don't need unanimity for political action. I read an interesting statistic the other day that said only 1% of Americans were ever active in the civil rights movement, but yet we got incredible change in this country through political action over civil rights. So there are points of pressure and points of leverage that can make a difference. Um, what we really need, though, is to convince a lot of the people in the middle. There are a lot of people in this country who are confused because they've heard all this doubt mongering, they've heard a lot of weird things. Those are the people we need to reach. And some of them are people you know, even though you live in the liberal progressive Bay area, you know, it could be your uncle, it could be your brother-in-law, it could be someone you went to college with, it could be a roommate, an apartment mate. I mean, people, it's not just in Nebraska, <laughs> right? Um, and it's a big, big mistake to think that this is just a problem of, um, with, uh, I always forget which one is which. Right? It's always confusing to me because red states are Republicans. Uh, 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 so, hi, um, I got a question. Yeah, hold on, can I just finish? So one thing. So anyway, the point is, you don't have to change everyone's mind. And the, the, the people in Congress who are owned by the fossil fuel industry, obviously you don't have to change their minds either. But you can still create political momentum among those who are not. So, so, so yes, next question, which is where? I think his right is here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you know what the question was? Maybe. No. no. Okay. I'm sorry.
Yeah. So, okay. So the question is about big cars. Why do people buy big cars? Why are they still driving them? What, how can we stop that? So the answer is a little complicated, of course, because people buy large cars for a lot of different reasons. But the fact is that actually, by and large, it is extremely sensitive to the price of gasoline. There are studies that show this. I mean, some people, you know, Arnold is going to drive a big car no matter what, right? Um, Schwarzenegger, yeah. Uh, some people will just always have big cars, and some people, you know, a few people might actually even need them. But it is actually very sensitive to price. So this is one reason why so many economists support a carbon tax. Because if the price of gasoline were higher, more people would drive fuel efficient cars. Now, you can also do it through these cafe standards, the, I forget which cafe standards, something about fuel economy. And the United States does have fuel economy standards. They're much weaker than in Europe, but we do have them. And actually, some of the recent decrease in greenhouse gas emissions since 2008 is related to the increase in the CAFE standards. So those regulations do help. They do make a difference, but it's not enough. And that's why people like citizens' climate lobby and economists say, look, what we really need to do is we need a carbon tax. We need to make fuel gasoline very expensive, and then that will help make electric cars more competitive. Of these scientists that are supporting um, climate change, all these scientists, of those, I mean, I hear there's the scientists that believe it's because man-made, and then there's those that believe it's a cyclical thing that's happened through the history of the Earth. So, what? How many of those scientists sure. believe that, and what do you, did you come across in your research? Yeah. There are um, no credible climate scientists who think that the observed warming of the last 50 years is due to natural variation. All scientists know that there is natural variation in the climate system, and this has been a very powerful doubt-mongering point because it confuses two things, both of which are true, but one of which is more important to the current discussion. Okay, so we know there's climate variability, there always have been, and that's actually fairly well understood scientifically. And the time scale on which that variability happens is also variable, right? There's local fluctuations, one year's a cold winter, next year's not. And then there's also long-term fluctuations, something known as the Milankovitch cycles, that have been quite well documented. They occur over tens to hundreds of thousands of years, and they're mostly caused by changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. So that happens, and we know that happens, and we know it's, it's true. But that's not what climate change is about when we talk about the observed warming of the last 50 years. So we have this up and down, these cycles that go on all the time. But superimposed over these longer term cycles is this steady increase that we've seen in the last 50 years. You cannot explain that increase in the last 50 years by anything other than the increase in greenhouse gas concentration. And there are literally thousands of scientific articles about this. And you know, if you're interested, I can explain in more detail. But the bottom line is that um, all of the scientific evidence tells us that something new and different has happened in the last 50 years. And we know that from ice core data. We know that from tree ring data. We know it from coral reef data. We know it from the instrumental records. So again, long history of up and down. But then in the last 50 years, this sort of rather shocking and much faster increase. And it's a steady increase. What we see is up and up and up and up again. It's, it's noisy, the signal's noisy. In any given year, it goes up and down, but overall, over the last 50 years, it's steadily up. Do you want me to just figure out? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah um, I, I really uh, have enjoyed this talk and reading your book. And I, I told you before that if I could have you know, custom ordered a book, it would have been this one. So I appreciate your work. Um, <coughs> I'm very interested in the topic of the science of evolution. Um, I am chair of the sociology department, so we're not you know, so much into the, the physical science part, but how so much uh, real hard evidence by, criticals, uh, by credible sources can be presented, and then how easily you can put some schmuck up on the, uh, on the news program, and I mean, what can we do to have some kind, it seems like you can talk to your blue in the face about the evidence, and then you have somebody who just wants to believe something that says something, and it, it seems like such a huge barrier to getting, you know, 
it's almost American to give fair time to something that has evidence and then to the quote other side but that has none. So. Yeah, Isaac Asimov once said that some people think that democracy means that any stupid opinion is just as good as you know any other one, right? And of course, that's not what democracy is, right? But um, it's a very difficult problem. Mark Morano, who is one of the emergence of doubt that we feature, features very prominently in the film, who used to be the communication director for Senator James Inhofe, sometimes referred to as Senator Snowball, the man who thought he could disprove climate change by bringing Snowball into Congress. Um, Murano once said, I can get you to believe a garbage man and disbelieve 7,000 scientists, right? And, and he's right. I mean, part of why this works is because it's extremely powerful. And it's extremely powerful in part because of what you exactly said, that a lot of us think that in a democracy, we should listen to both sides of the issue. So therefore, if some, you know, you ask like, how many scientists think this is related to natural cycles, the answer is really none. But we find somebody who's prepared to say that on television. Probably that person isn't even a scientist at all. If he is a scientist, he's probably not a climate scientist. And I shouldn't have said none. There actually is one person in America, and it's someone you may have read about. It's Willie Soon, who was in the New York Times just a couple of weeks ago. He does claim that all of this is natural variability. And we now know that he received $1.2 million from the fossil fuel industry to say that. So he's not exactly independent. Um, but if we get Willie Soon on television and we put him next to, um, you know, let's say Steve Schneider from Stanford, until he died recently, what you see is a debate. You see two people who seem to be scientists, who seem to be knowledgeable, debating, and you walk away thinking, well, we don't really know. And that's the whole point. That's what they want you to think, because they know, and market research shows, that if you think we don't know, then you won't support doing anything because after all, why should we do something about a problem that might not even exist? So it's a very, very powerful strategy. So part of the reason I've done the work I've done is because I think the only way to combat it is to expose it and to say that's what it is. The latest data from NASA and the U.S. Navy, and by the way, the U.S. Navy has been measuring the thickness of Arctic ice since the 1950s because of sending submarines to the Soviet Union under the Arctic ice. The total volume of Arctic sea ice is down 80%. This is summer sea ice. This means that in a very short amount of time, there will be no summer ice in the Arctic. That is a profoundly well, it's a profound change. 
And it's going to have all kinds of implications, some of which we understand, like for habitat loss, some of which we don't understand, like what the impact is on, say, ocean circulation. Um, something that a lot of people are worried about, but it's not well understood scientifically. That can't be reversed. So this is why I think so many people in the scientific community are already starting to be worried. Because now we're seeing, some, and again, this was predicted, the ice albedo feedback is something that scientists wrote about in the 1970s. Once you start melting the ice, how many people here know what that is? Oh, quite a few, but not everyone. So the ice albedo feedback is the fact that um, ice is very reflective. Like if you go skiing, you know you have to um, wear a lot of sunscreen and dark sunglasses to be so bright from the snow and ice. So snow and ice are very, very reflective. And so one of the things that keeps the Arctic cold is that there's all that snow and ice reflecting the sunlight back to space. But as the ice begins to melt, and in the Arctic, if it melts, you get uh, water exposed instead. Uh, and now you have dark, absorptive water instead of ice. If that water absorbs the sunlight, it heats up. That heating melts the ice. Now you have less ice, so less reflection, more heating, and you get a feedback loop. That's called the ice albedo feedback. And so that has, that's been known for a long time. It was modeled in the 1970s by scientists named Suki Nabe. So that has happened now. And so scientists predicted that we would see a major loss of Arctic sea ice. That's happened. We can't fix it. So that's why I think we need to have a sense of urgency about this problem. We can't really afford to wait any longer. We've already waited too long. I mean, as a historian, you know, I, some, here's what I get depressed about. It's knowing that we knew all this stuff 20, 30 years ago, and we sat on our posteriors and done not much to fix it, right? So I think we should have a sense of urgency. We should have a sense that we've lost time, that we should have been working on this when President George H.W. Bush signed the Framework Convention, and now we need to get our butts in gear and make up for the lost time. Hello. Um, so we talk about um, everything we could do over here in the U.S., but we're also hearing about uh, pollution, like places like China, where you can see the smoke or smoke even outer space. So um, the pollution there, how bad is the effect to the, glo uh, the global effect of that, and would that negate all the effort that we're doing here? Yeah. I mean, well, it's a very, very important question. Of course, we call it global climate change because it is a global problem. But so, and there's a lot of different ways you can answer that question. But I, I like to think about two things. First of all, the two biggest polluters in the world are the United States and China. So obviously, the United States and China have to act. So that means the United States has to act. Second, leadership. If we sit around and say, well, we're not going to do anything until anybody else does anything, I mean, that's the ultimate anti-leadership position. So if the United States wants to be a leader in the world and model what this looks like for other people, as well as sell solar technology to the rest of the world, we need to be doing it. That's number three. The Chinese are beating the pants off us in solar technology. They're already way ahead of us. The cost of solar power in China is less than it is here, and they're exporting it to the rest of the world. So we're actually missing an opportunity um, both to do the right thing and make money uh, by letting the Chinese get ahead of us on solar power. So, you know, and the fourth thing is that, I'm actually, I was just reading some things on this today that a Chinese colleague sent. Most people in China think that the Chinese government is going to do something very significant to control greenhouse gases in the next few years because pollution has become a political issue in China. Pollution in China is now so bad that they're seeing protest rallies against it, and the government recognizes it as a political vulnerability. So I think we're going to see pretty significant change in China in the next couple of years. But even if we didn't, it wouldn't be an excuse for us to do nothing. And there's a little thing even I saw there about the snowflake and the avalanche. And that, how would, I forgot exactly what it says, that no snowflake and an avalanche ever said, what is the exact? What is it reading? Right like, no snowflake and an avalanche. I can't finish it, but. It was not like it ever says, oh, this isn't my responsibility or something. I don't know. I mean, the point was that every, you know, the avalanche is made of a lot of snowflakes, and greenhouse gases are made up of all the people. You got it? What is it? Yeah, no snowflake in an avalanche feels responsible. Oh, that was it. <laughs> there you go. Right. Yeah. No, there's so much to say and so much to know about this topic. 
so you you have a, a family member or a friend or a colleague, someone you respect dearly, and they surprise you and turn to you and say, oh, climate change is just a hoax. What is your effective response in a few sentences or less? What's your elevator pitch? You've got three floors. Yeah. Well, uh, it depends who the person is, right? So the, the elevator pitch has to start with a question. And in that case, I would say, why do you think that? Why do you think it's a hoax, right? Because if they answer it, then it begins to tell you what you, you might say. Because there are scientists who have proven that there's doubt. OK, well, that's where, right. So my story is then, actually, we know that the vast majority of climate scientists who have worked on this are in agreement, climate change is happening, it's underway, it's not reversible, and the longer you wait, the more expensive and difficult this is going to be to fix. I mean, that's one elevator pitch. There are many, many other versions of it. I mean, it really depends on where the person is coming from, I think. You know, if they say, I think this is just, you know, an excuse to expand big government, they say, great, let's talk about small government solutions to climate change. Let's talk about what people are doing in their communities on the ground, state and local level, right? So it really just depends, I think. I feel like that's one of the biggest things that I've learned, that people have many reasons for not wanting to confront this issue. Um, you know, we focused very specifically on the group of people who had been powerful and influential and who were working with a set of free market libertarian think tanks. Um, but there are lots and lots of reasons that people feel the way they do. And so I do think the elevator pitch has to be adjusted depending upon who the person is and what their reasoning is. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, John D. Rockefeller as, the, uh, as a, the physicist, but does he have any relation to the Robert Baron Rockefeller from the Eighteen hundreds, who started the oil industry? I was no, wondering. no, I, I think you got. You, I was a joke. I said he was a communist. It was meant to be a joke. I'm, no. I'm, I was just saying because the last name seems similar. I was wondering if he actually had a relation to that Rockefeller. No, but there's no physicist named Rockefeller in the story. I thought you said that. Um, oh, they, you know, Fred Seitz was the president of the Rockefeller University. Oh, okay. Yes, and that the Rockefeller University was funded by the. Uh, oil baron Rockefeller family. But interestingly enough, some of you may know the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, which is a foundation, has recently uh, announced its plan to divest from fossil fuels, to divest its endowment. So the heirs of John D. Rockefeller are proving to still be environmentalists. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. I think I believe I heard you on NPR and that you flew through a hurricane in a plane. No, that wasn't me. Uh, might have been Catherine Hato. Yeah. I have not thrown I would be or if you were that crazy. I would be I throwing up all over the place if I tried to do that. <laughs> well, I did have a question about um, you know, with the draft in California, you know, NASA has got their satellites up and saying have about less than a year's worth of water and the governor's issued water restriction, you know everybody cut down 30% to um, you know, the major cities, which use about 10% of the water, while the, re the remaining 90% goes to either agriculture or fracking, which has seen smaller uh, restrictions based on, especially on fracking. You know, so within a year's time, there's going to be a real uh, panic and to, for you know, water. And at you know, a bigger moment like that, what do you think? Is that what it's going to actually take for people to really take climate change seriously? Is going, why is there no water coming out of my faucet? I mean, that's just in California, so I mean, we do have the bigger storms in the East Coast, but is this kind of like a, uh, you know, a microcosm of what's going to happen nation and worldwide? Right. Well, it could well be, and I think, you know, I used to always say I'm a historian, I don't predict the future, but then I wrote this book, so now I can't say that anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, people ask this question all the time. You know, it's, the, it's the what's it going to take question. But I think you're right. I think that as people begin to see it hitting home in concrete and tangible ways and hitting their pocketbooks, because one of the things that's going to happen very likely is it's not just that water shortages will hit Californians. It will also raise the price of agricultural products. And that will start to ramify through the whole country. And we've seen that before in, in bad drought years. So, 
I think it, it is, I think this issue, I mean, people across the country are talking about this draft. So I think, particularly if it happens in concert with some other things as well, like maybe some bad wildfires. I mean, I hate to say this, but people probably have to get killed for people to pay attention. And I, I feel like that's one of the tragedies of delay too, right? That we get to the point where real damage starts, you know, really serious damage starts to happen. So I wish that weren't the case, but it seems like it probably is. So I think we have time for one more question. Thank you for letting me go again. I just think I had a question. <laughs> I, I, um, what really interests me in part of this is certainly there are people who are evil enough to profiteer from something by knowing something is false, but you know, portraying the opposite. But I, I, my guess is that there are a lot of people who don't know that, they, do, they just want to believe what is useful to them and they don't even really know they're doing it. And I guess what's your take on uh, some of these men and women, I think it's mostly men, involved? Is it that they, they really know the truth but they're putting this other thing forward or was the political advantage to a greater good for them? Or I mean, it, it seems like they would be smart enough to know uh, that that the other science could also, that the real science could be credible. Right? Yeah. It's a really important question. I mean, the way I think about it is, goes a bit like this. There are evil people in the world, and I think we make a big mistake not to recognize that. And I think especially in the United States, we want to believe that everyone's good, that this is a good country, we're good people. And we actually have a really hard time in this country, I think much harder than some other countries in the world, of sort of naming and labeling evil when we see it. And having spent time reading tobacco documents, tobacco industry documents, there were some really evil people who knew that their product was killing millions of people and just came up with new and more creative ways to keep people smoking and to make their products more addictive, to sell to even younger children. Um, and that, to me, was evil. So there are evil people, and I think that's important to acknowledge. But I don't think it's the dominant thing. And I think, in a way, politically, it's not the more important thing. I think much more common is the second one you offer, that people persuade themselves for one reason or another that this is appropriate or right. And I think that is the story here, that the people we studied really did believe that they were protecting democracy and freedom. And I know Bill Nuremberg for sure thought, because I knew him, um, you know, Bill didn't think the science was all wrong. He just thought, oh yeah, there'll be a little bit of climate change, but it's no big deal. You know, you're overreacting, you're a hysterical female. Uh, you know, um, and don't worry, you know, we'll fix it with technology. I mean, that's kind of what he thought. So he downplayed the science, he dismissed it, but also I think that he and his cronies, his colleagues, had a kind of ends justify the means philosophy, that they thought that it was really, really important to stop government intervention in the marketplace. So if it meant that they attacked science or scientists, well, you know, that was the price you paid for the sort of greater good. Which of course, when I first realized that that was how they thought, that, how ironic was that? Because you know, I grew up in the Cold War, we were always taught one of the terrible, most terrible things about the Soviet Union and Marxism was that they thought that ends justified the means. And I thought, well, that's what these guys thought. You know, they were the anti-communists, which reminds me of an old joke that my grandmother used to say, you know, a policeman is beating up a protester at a rally, and the protester says, but I'm an anti-communist, and the policeman says, I don't care what kind of communist you are. <laughs> or the other joke my grandmother used to like to tell was, um, communist, communism is the ex sorry, capitalism is the exploitation of man by man, and communism is exactly the reverse. So, <laughs> it takes a minute to get that one, yes, okay. <laughs> In any event, so I think that they, they kind of justify it. And I think it's important because I think that's the part that resonates. Most people are not evil. Most people don't want to support a company, you know, making products that are going to kill people, right? But lots of us, you know, we like the way we live. We don't necessarily want to change the way we live. Uh, maybe we're a university. We don't want to have to invest a lot of upfront costs in energy efficiency. We're not sure where we're going to raise the money. Or maybe we do like driving that big car. 
You know, maybe we have a Girl Scout troop and we actually use the big car once a month so we justify having it all the time. I mean, there's so many different ways that we can all kind of persuade ourselves. And who wants to pay more money for gas? Nobody wants to pay more for gas except, you know, two crazy environmentalists, right? So, so it's very easy to kind of be drawn into these things and to say, well, you know, and the scientists aren't even sure anyway, right? And that's why it's so powerful because it sort of ties in, it taps into the part of us it doesn't want this to be true. And even, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be a member of Americans for Prosperity not to want this to be true. And so I think that's the really important lesson. And again, it gets back to your question about the elevator pitch. So find out why your particular father, uncle, brother-in-law, whoever it is, doesn't want it to be true. What is it that they're most worried about? And that might be your point of entry into a conversation. Or, Maybe not. Maybe you just give up and join Citizens Climate Lobby. Yeah. Your talk was very enlightening, and a colleague of yours from Harvard, a sociologist with like TED Talks, she became the most listened to person in that whole series, and my suggestion is you would be wonderful. Well, I've done a TED Talk. <laughs> thank oh. you. Thank you. I have. Actually, I have. In fact, embarrassingly enough, wearing the same dress. So <laughs> I sometimes feel like I can't wear this dress anymore, but I really like it. So I'm glad nobody here has seen the TED Talk. But if you've seen the TED Talk, you'll recognize me because I'm wearing this dress. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that. What, who is the colleague who has this part? Oh, I don't remember her name. Okay, well, I'm sure I can find out. Yeah. So, so one thing that I've been getting a lot from this uh, talk, I guess you could say, is that it's a lot about uh, fear-mongering, sort of uh, placing down in people's minds. But when, when we're talking about this, we're talking about scientists sort of uh, through the belief of the greater good covering things up. One thing we haven't talked about that is kind of, I guess, confusing me is the use of media. The use of media and how, sure, all American, a lot of Americans, I think, uh, know that this is an issue, but don't take immediate action because it is the media that we're hearing, the news we're hearing, the two people on the uh, media where there's one person who's for and one person who's against, even if they're not scientists, it's a lot of what we hear and what does it take to be heard, I guess is what I'm asking. What does it take to go onto the media, which keeps uh, badgering us with this sort of two uh, argument uh, thing that we're hearing and realize that, oh, it's just one thing. Professionals are saying one thing and it's the unprofessional saying another thing. Because I'm seeing this in a lot of things, not just tobacco, not just global warming, but in things like, uh, I've got a feeling we're about to get a lot of hate all of a sudden, but like marijuana, how it's also causing like brain cancer and things. But a lot of media uh, sort of pushing to the side. Marijuana, I guess, pro-marijuana people are pushing that to the side. I'm not sure if that's uh, commercial or anything, but it feels like a lot of it is media. And what do we do against to fight the media that is telling us these things? Uh, you're absolutely right. The media is a huge part of the story, and in the book we go into that issue in more detail. This whole strategy depends upon the media, because without the media perpetuating the, the doubt, mongering, the, the sense of a debate, the whole thing would just fizzle out. And one of the things that we discovered when we were doing our research was the way in which the tobacco industry, the fossil fuel industry, these think tanks would actually target the media and pressure them to do this two-side thing, to present both sides of the issue. And of course, part of the reason it works, though, is because the media themselves think they're supposed to be, they think that objectivity is giving both sides of the issue. And so one of the things I've done in my work is if I have the opportunity to talk to journalists, and often journalists will ask me, well, what should I do? which I think is kind of weird. I'm like, well, you should figure it out. You're the journalist, you know? But one of the things I'll say is, well, first of all, you know, find out who these people are. Do they actually have credentials? Don't put an, uh, you know, an economist against a climate scientist if, it, if you're talking about climate. I mean, if you're talking about economics, then that's different, of course. Um, you know, 
who are these people, where are their credentials, but also that the whole model of both sides doesn't make sense for many issues. In fact, probably for most issues, we kind of have this two-side thing, I think, in part because we live in a two-party political system, so we're used to the idea that political debate is Democrats versus Republicans. But actually, even in politics, that's really damaging, because the reality is that many political positions, many political issues, Americans have a lot of diverse views, and often hearing those diverse views can be helpful, because if we're trying to sort out our own views about you know, whether marijuana should be legalized, for example, it helps to actually hear a range of views and a spectrum of opinion, and that can actually help us figure out, you know, is there a reasonable compromise to be had? So when you polarize a debate into he said, she said, right and left, Democrat, Republican, it's actually incredibly unhelpful. And for science, it's actually, it's, it's almost always inaccurate and misleading. So one of the things that I talk about with journalists, and if any of you are studying journalism or thinking about becoming journalists, is to try to think through other alternatives to the two-side model. Um, because I think if we could break that and start thinking about conversations and discussions with a range of views, that would probably actually be helpful in a lot of ways, not just for you know, climate change. I think um, another thought on that, we actually had uh, the two authors of, or directors for um, Project Censor, and it talks about how there are very important uh, stories out there that you never hear about because they're not popular with modern media. So it's another, um, um, it's another example of how journalism used to just present the facts and then let, let the people decide with the facts how they were supposed to think. We don't do that anymore. And well, one, yeah, one other thing I wanted to add about that too. Also, you know, as readers, there are things you can do to be proactive to make a difference. So just last week, Newsweek ran an article about the supposed true cost of wind power. So an article was very critical of wind power saying, oh, it kills birds and things like this. But it turned out that that article was written by somebody who was being paid for by the Koch brothers. But Newsweek did not reveal that. So how did it come out? Well, some people at Greenpeace who knew who that person was because they had been tracking it, contacted the editors of Newsweek and said, you need to disclose, you need to point out to your readers who this person is works for because that affects the credibility of the claim. And so Newsweek, to their credit, have in fact done that now, but only after they were pre pressured by citizens. So I think that shows that there are things we can do to affect the media, but a lot of times it wouldn't occur to us that we could do that, but actually we can. We have time for one more question? About 10 minutes ago. <laughs> okay, I think we should make this the last one because I'm okay. getting a little tired. I bet Thanks. you are. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask why is doing good so expensive? Why is doing good so, so expensive? expensive? Like being so environmentally friendly is so expensive these days. So people kind of tend to push it away. Um, but why is it so expensive? Well, okay, two things. First of all, it isn't always expensive. I think this is kind of a myth, and I think one of the things that we need to do is break the myth, right? So energy efficiency is cheap. You save money when you save energy, but it almost always involves some upfront investment. So like we just replaced all the light bulbs in our house with um, LED lights. They're unbelievably more efficient than incandescent bulbs. They're like 90% more efficient. I mean, an incandescent light bulb, basically almost all of the energy is being wasted on heat. Um, but these light bulbs cost, I think, like eight dollars each or something. You know, they're eight times more expensive than a conventional light bulb. So it means you've got to make the commitment up front. And that's hard to do, you know, if you're living on a fixed income or you're maybe a student and you don't have, you don't make much money. So that's a problem. We need to work through that and we need to think about it. And there are things that some communities have done. In Massachusetts, there are rebates for low-income people who want to, you know, get uh, more efficient light bulbs and things. So there are things that could be done, but we need to do more of that. Um, some things are more expensive, like if you're thinking about, you think it's like organic food, if you go to the supermarket or something, yeah. I mean, organic food is more expensive to buy. Um, and that gets tricky because, again, we have this problem of external costs. So when people use pesticides, they often can increase 
productivity of their fields and produce more apples or whatever it is. And so those apples are cheaper when you buy them in the grocery store, but they're really expensive for the farm workers who now become sick because they're exposed to pesticides, or the birds that are killed by it, or other external costs. So how do we work out those, paying for those external costs? And that's something that economists haven't really sorted out. So if there are any aspiring economists in the audience, right, any young people who are thinking about that, figure out how to, how to reflect the price of goods and services to reflect the true cost of those products. What I like to sometimes call the true cost of living is a really challenging problem. And a smart economist who could figure that out could not only win the Nobel Prize, but could actually like make the world a better place too. Okay, can we stop? Naomi, here? yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.